This is Books for Breakfast, a podcast where we talk about books and writing. I'm Enda Wiley. And I'm Peter Sir. And you're all very welcome to this morning's show. Coming up later this month, an online festival of literary films. I'll be talking to Imram director Liam Carson. And today's Toaster Challenge guest is Irish novelist Henrietta McCurvey. She'll be in to talk about her favourite book and also her new novel, which was published this year called A Talented Man. So the coffee's made. The toast is on. And the books are on the table. Maravna Hain. Agustash Kiratin, Ke Hoshech Mayor Agor Nanayo. Few da daga hagesh is Kavoshkoch the yet on Nach Mail and a Ocht. Nor Kalurome, Forsa Hachta and a Lohir. Or Needin Sanoilach, Achtus no a Fosh. Is a follow Garegan a detum, is Gadean Dean a Hishkint. Gorsay lesh an oilucht, is gor nafish ar gurr navni. Fiach, nach ufer, go hangel. Stainem da reirshin is slugim an rairim, is skolfert na nasahe gira. Ach, keir ar mara, nier angel na rine e is na behi gachil na rien and an. Kjol o shon makarlien, ashturhon le mar wakati erna duino elegies. The Hwyr Rilke, music by Sean McCarthyan and Maura Wakati's translations of Rilke's Duino elegies. Read by Darina Nikineja. Quid han wunahe ka eider a literhe na bliana isha han eila literiachta Imram. The Irish Language Literary Festival, Imram, from the old Irish word for wandering or voyage or rowing about, has been a fixture of the autumn calendar for many years now. But obviously this year is a bit different with events pushed into the winter and pushed online uh, also. So I asked the festival's director, Liam Carson, to tell us about the festival and this year's plans. So for the road, we're going to talk to Liam. Grimmie Margaret, Peter. Okay, so if you have a car, Aaron Olas, Fween Vela, could you fill our listeners in, first of all, on the origins of this festival, how it came about and how long it's been going for, what some of your kind of personal highlights would be over the years? Yeah, well, Imran was founded back in 2004. Now, I was brought up speaking Irish. I, I'd always worked in the field of literature. Um, I'd worked as a, as a publicist uh, for a number of Irish publishers over the years. And I, 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 but I hadn't read much literature in Irish until I was until around about two, the year 2004, two, 2003, in fact. I was in Donegal. I was with my girlfriend, um, Neve. We were, uh, she was touring a show. I went into the bookshop of Vigis Gale in uh, Glen Colm Kill and I bought a few books of poetry. One of them was um, Thruk Changaka, Stream of Tongues by Belfast poet Garage McLaughlin. I suppose like a lot of people, I've had the sort of, uh, my, my father had lots of books in Irish, you know, but they would have been you know, traditional sort of Gael talk literature. Um, he read a lot of Shots of Magrina, Myra. He would have had books like in Talanach, um, Peg and all the rest of it, you know. And like I was I was growing up reading um, J.T. Ballard and Angela, Angela Carter and uh, uh, Frank O'Hara, people like that. And then what happened was that I, I started realising that there was amazing stuff out there. You know, it was very, very modern. Modern, that you've got Michael O'Connila, you've got Alan Titley writing strange parables, you have Dachio Murray writing strange, um, almost Ray Bradbury style, fantastic literature uh, in Irish. And then you start going back into the traditional and stuff as well, and you start discovering that the magic is there. But then, you know, I'd, I'd been involved in organising literary events for years, but I started realising there weren't that many, uh, there was no Irish language literature festival. So I saw that there was this terrible gap and that there was no platform mm for the writers that were wonderful writers out there and then the other thing is if you're an Irish language writer you don't get an awful lot of exposure in the media you know there isn't going to be a full page interview with you in the Irish Times that is the the harsh reality of it so we wanted to give a platform uh, to Irish language writers I then met uh, Joe Woods who was running Poetry Ireland at the time he weighed in with um, uh, support he introduced me um, to Jack Gilligan and uh, uh, Dublin City Council and then I met up with you know Forrest Nick Gilligan Deirdre Davitt was there so all those people gave support 
Uh, Gabriel Rosenstock came up with the name. Gabriel was a big force in in, in the early days as well. Uh, so what we wanted to do from the start was to mix up things, you know, music, uh, visuals, that it wasn't just, you know, yes, there is a place for just the lone voice on the stage or whatever, but we wanted to have production from the very start. We wanted to blend music. One of the early things that we did was the Gaelic Jazz Project, where I got poets and gave the, the work to jazz musicians who then created jazz music, you know, uh, so, you know to mix in with the, the poetry and that, that was the approach from the very I know because there, there are event, I mean there are big events in the pavilion aren't there every, usually every, every I mean there have been up to now that every year with, with music or translating kind of whether it's Dylan or Springsteen or that took on a life of its own. Yeah. I, I'm a huge Dylan fan. Anybody who knows me, I'm totally obsessed with Dylan. I, I just said, well, well, let's translate Dylan into Irish. And uh, Gabriel Rosen, you know, I gave the first song I gave to Gabriel Rosenstock was um, Shelter from the Storm. Uh, I emailed it to him within 20 minutes. Yeah. He came back in absolutely immaculate Irish. Um, uh, they a Steve on Sturm. And then, you know, like a Rolling Stone, where they clock her fan. Uh, got a sir, somebody who did the gospel stuff as well. They ooled the gun again. And I mean, people actually said to me, what a ridiculous idea. You know, this won't work. And I'm thinking about Dylan now. I mean, that, that his stuff was draw, drawing on the tradition. He was hanging about the Clancy's. You know, Liam Clancy spoke Irish. Uh, you know, like he actually absorbed a lot of that stuff. You know, so the, the, the patterns of the songs were very easily rendered into in, into Irish. Now. And, uh, you know, the Dylan project was brilliant. We had Liam O'Malley. His heart was in those kind of songs already. He'd already been singing Dylan songs on stage on his, his solo performances. So like, and then we had Steve Cooney on guitar and arranging the entire, entire thing. And they, they just, those shows just take them on. And they work brilliant. One of the ones that worked brilliantly in Irish, actually, believe it or not, was Bowie, because I sort of went, you know, is Bowie going to work in Irish? And I actually had people trolling me, sort of going, oh, you can't possibly do Bowie in Irish. Don't be so ridiculous. It's an insult to Bowie. But Bowie sang in French, he sang in German. He sang songs translated from German. So what is the big beef about Irish? You know, it's it's the it's the it's the post colonial hang up nonsense. You know, and I, I have no time for these people. You know, but those shows. I mean, what happens is people come along, they love them. We also put the lyrics on the screen, so quite often you will get people singing along to the songs at the end of the night. And people come up to me afterwards, going, "God, I didn't realise I had so much Irish." So it, it's a very effective mechanism in reminding people how. Uh, the Irish is in their in their head at some level, whether they you know, know it or not. So, I suppose yeah. what you're saying is well that, that Imram isn't isn't solely directed at those at those who have Gael Galifa and and are kind of free, so, so that so that yeah. it's open to a wider kind of audience. Is that part of the thinking behind it? It is, yeah, it is. I mean, one of the things I feel that has been a tragic in, in Irish literary life over the past 20 years, which one of the things that Imram has tried to address from the very start, you know, if you go back to the time, well, say, when, the time that you would have been a director of the Irish Writers' Centre, for example, you know, mm. there, I think there was much more of a traffic between uh, poetry in English and poetry in Irish, between writers in Irish and writers in English. You had a lot more people who were writing in both languages as well. Michael Hartnett is an obvious example. Paddy Bush is another example. Um, you know, a lot of, lot of the, the poets who were writing in English would have been very clued into the Inchi generation. May, may not have been writing in Irish themselves, but they were clued into what was happening in Irish. I don't think the same level of, of traffic exists. I don't think the same level of awareness exists. And we are constantly trying to redress that balance. We're trying to say that, you know, Irish language literature and English language literature should be on the same level and on the same platform and interacting and having a relationship well, with Well, tell each other. us, that's a little bit about the history, but tell, tell us about, I, I mean, obviously this is, a, this is a particularly kind of hard time for, for the arts in general and for anybody trying to run a festival it has to be a bit of a nightmare this whole COVID thing so tell us tell us about that I mean about what happened this year and about moving moving online yeah well I mean I've been doing MRAM now for 15 years so earlier on this year I was I was way ahead of myself I was saying I you know this stuff is water off a duck's back to me I I'm, I'm way ahead of myself I had people booked in I had the venues booked earlier than ever I was looking forward to in my psyche, having signed off and everything by the end of June and t having an easy summer and then kicking back in the gear again to do the publicity. Then everything happened and I didn't honestly know what the hell to do at the start. Like most people, um, everybody was sit saying, well, it'll all be over by October, of course. Then you start reading books about the Spanish flu in 1918. You discover that nine times out of ten in the pandemic, the, the worst uh, scenario is in October, um, which is the time our festival was. And I was talking to people like uh, Julianne Mooney, who runs the Dublin Book Festival, and she goes, well, there's no way um, we're going to stage a festival because I, I just think it's going to be really bad in October and everybody else is in denial. She was very right. Some festivals were at an advantage in a way of being at the start of the pandemic, like Kirch, they went online yes. immediately and they built up a huge audience online. You know, and then there was the no novelty of it. I then started seeing people doing a lot of stuff on Zoom. I decided then after 
after a certain period of thinking, no, Zoom isn't going to work. I, I wanted Imran to have the same production values. So I decided to cut back the program a little bit. We had to, we had a whole themed program. We had to drastically change it in lots of ways. We've kept some of the core events that we had planned, but I decided immediately to, to in, invest in, in, in proper filming of events so that we would have high quality events because I think people, I, I reckon by the time we would have stuff up online, people would be suffering from screen fatigue. So that on Zoom, I'm sick of Zoom personally. I, I wanted to have something of, of a higher production value that was more like a film, something that was beautiful to look at because it's always been important to us to have stuff that was beautiful to look at and to listen yeah, to. Yeah, that's what I was going to say because I, mean, I, I noticed that. I mean, I mean, we've all been doing these kind of online things. We've all been kind of engaging online and, and, and it's kind of hard at the end of the day, maybe when you've been on Zoom, you know, doing Zoom meetings and, and Zoom teaching, whatever. And then you, you, and then you, you kind of log on to a Zoom reading or festival and it kind of as you say that sort of exhaustion kicks in so you're up against that and so I was very interested to see the, the, the way you've gone about I mean I, I saw the, the recent one you know kind of focusing on translation with, with people like Theo and Katrina Theo Dorgan and Katrina Eklerkin and, and Celia Dufresne and just the way in which that came across and the kind of professionalism of it and the interest it's just it's a different approach it's a very welcome approach I have to say so tell us a bit I mean you're presenting this Imram uh, this year, it's 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 Fela Erlina the Scanon Literature at Holon Gokriach. So an online festival of magical literary films. It's kind of an interesting way to put it. Yeah, well, we've always wanted to take some people into another realm. And if you look at the projects that we have this year and where they are taking people into another realm, you have Lure Nanakraha, which is Ovid's uh, Metamorphosis. Um, we we I, I picked five stories from Ovid to be rendered in Irish by Katrina Lee Clerkin, who you just mentioned there. Um, then I invited Cahill Porter to, to, to read the stories. Uh, we'd planned originally to stage this in the Botanic Gardens. It was going to be a, a gigantic puppet show in the Botanic Gardens. And we were, go- we were going to be inside the glass houses because a lot of, you know, Ovid stories are about people being transformed into trees. So we were going to have people as trees in the glass houses. But then, you know, glass houses in the middle of a p- oh. pandemic, not a good idea. So <laughs> puppet show, not a good the puppet show became a shadow puppet show. So my partner, Eve Lauder, created shadow puppets. As well as that, we have Margaret Lonergan, who does a lot of work for him. And some of the stories are illustrated through images, um, classical artwork projected onto a screen. And then I invited uh, um, Sheila Denver, um, the traditional musician and singer, and Thomas Johnson. They've been working together. Thomas himself had suggested Sheila, and he, he runs Kill Connected. So they created sound effects and composed new music so that while Cahill is reading this music is playing behind him, then it'll break into traditional song every now and again, or Sheila will sing a few lines of Ovid. And then, you know, then it will shift into the next story, which is Shadow Puppets. Now, originally it was going to be one big long film, but we decided... Hang on, we've got five stories here, one big long film, maybe too much for people to handle. Break it down into five short films. So you have, so when you break it down into five short films, they're going from 15 minutes to 25 minutes. And we're going to release one every two days over a period of 10 days with that. I'm just interested in Ovid because it just seems to me that Ovid is having a bit of a moment or maybe, but maybe he's never not had a moment in the sense of, uh, he, he keeps coming up. I mean, I know there was an anthology last year of poetry where, where poets responded to, to Ovid and, and there's been other kind of projects like that. What is, what is the attraction of, of Ovid? Well, my specific trigger originally was this year, originally I'd planned that every single event would be about climate change or about the destruction of the environment and one of the things that I noticed when I picked up Metamorphosis was that in the very first story, you know, the story of the creation, uh, and you have this sort of humanity comes in after the, sort of the gods have created the world, and, and then you have the, the age of silver, and you have the age of gold. And what you actually have thousands of years ago is over describing the landscape being raped by human beings, the landscape being destroyed by human beings. Then if you have the story of Phaeton, um, for example, which is one of the ones that we have, and it's a classical story of um, hubris, um, of Phaeton goes to his father, the sun god, and he wants to be acknowledged as being the son of the sun god. So he's saying, you know, give me a go at riding the chariot across the heavens, I can do that. You know, I, you know, his ego takes over, and you know that—that that to me is almost a, um, 
again, the truth has been written 2,000 years ago that this is the exact moment that we're, that we're living in, that you have the Bolsonaros and the Boris Johnsons and the Donald Trumps of this world who are complete and utter total idiots. We know they're complete and utter total idiots. We know they're morons, but they are given the reins of the chariot. And what happens when you give them the reins of the chariot is that they burn the heavens, they scorch the earth, and they destroy the world. So I went to myself, this story is a story of our times, and it was written thousands of years ago. And that's why I wanted to have Ovid, you know. So even though we sort of moved away from the overall arching theme mm. that we'd originally planned, I kept that in. And I think if you look at all the, every single thing in Ovid resonates with, with, with today. And uh, they're, they're just f fantastic stories. They're a fantastic weave of stories. I love the way one story will go into another story and the whole theme of transformation behind them. Uh, they're, they're, it's just st stunning poetry. And um, I thought it would be nice to do it in Irish as well, as simple as that, because it, wasn't, it hasn't really been done in Irish before, as far as I know. Though, like, Homer, Homer has been done. Just sitting, sitting there with pen in hand. These details will be on Imram's website as well, and we'll link to them on our own um, show notes at booksforbreakfast.buzzsprout.com as well. But tell us a bit more. This I, I noticed just looking at the program, a couple of other things that jumped out at me. One of them was the Gaelic Garden of the Dead with McGillivray and and you know Gary Gaelach Namarov. Who is McGillivray, and what is the Gaelic Garden of the Dead? I'd never heard of McGillivray until about well two years ago, and uh, I was in a bookshop uh, browsing through the poetry section. I saw this title, The Gaelic Garden of the Dead. I went, that looks interesting. Um, I took it out. Um, I started reading it, and um, I was absolutely knocked back by it. Um, she's, uh, it's, it, McGillivray is the pen name of um, Kirsten Norrie. She was brought up uh, speaking Scottish Gaelic. She sings in Scottish Gaelic. She's written these poems, which are about the, the you know the Gaelic tree alphabet, and um, then Mary Queen of Scots comes into into the poems uh, as well. So she she delves completely into history, and she has narratives of animal you know so people being transformed into animals, and there's uh, there's spirits, and there are monsters, and there is the, the voices of humans, the voices of creatures, there is the, the, the Gaelic language, the, 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 the death of the Gaelic language, but the endurance of the Gaelic language in Scotland. And she's also just an absolutely amazing singer. She, she has an ethereal voice. She has a deep grasp of where those songs come from. She's also a performance artist. She does, uh, originally, again, I, I, I planned to bring McGillivray over and we were going to stage a, you know, a live performance. And, and she, she's a filmmaker as well. She has amazing beautiful um, films I'd, I'd recommend anybody to go and look at her website um, um she's uh, her books are published by blood axe if you go to the blood axe website there's a lot of information about her there and um, she's published a number of books um with blood axe and you know she, she's one of these writers who has a grasp of history but there, there, there's something like alchemical about her writing as well it's it's it's, it's like an incantation and so what we did then, you know, was we, we, we've got, more, again, we've got more Lonergan to do images. And then Sean McAuley, the Irish jazz and avant-garde composer, I, I just thought from the very start that he, he's worked with uh, a lot of our Irish traditional musicians over the years. And he's also worked on a lot of Imran projects. And he, he understands the traditional music, he understands um, jazz and experimental music. So they were a natural fit to put the two of them together. And obviously they couldn't be in the same room together. So what you do there is... Uh, Kirsten would 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 uh, record herself singing the songs unaccompanied. She would send them the sound files to Sean. Sean would compose the the music, uh, um, separate mix the two in together. Then Margaret Lonergan creates the images. Then they these then all the images and the soundtrack go to. Um, an engineer, sound engineer um, that I have, I'll call Liam Grant, um, and then Liam will sync all of this material together, and then you, you essentially have a, a poem film. So in this case, it's not like you're, you're filming performers on a stage. It's it's the entire thing has been created by individuals in their own rooms, and then you mix it all together. There's such kind of innovation being shown in all this. I kind of even think that once, if you know, if we get past this, if we get past, you know, and even the Black Death passed eventually, like it, it, when we get out in, into the, the kind of the blue skies of the post-COVID land, I think a lot of this innovation will remain. I think that like that the kind the kinds of things that are, that are that are being done. I think they'll become maybe, will they, or will they, um, become sort of permanent parts of things like festivals or education. I mean, I think some of these things, obviously, it'll be brilliant to be, to be back in a theatre. But but some of this kind of innovation and some of the kind of you know involving people from distant places and and mixing and matching, 
I think. Yeah, do, do I think, think so. I mean, there's other things that I want to do next year as well in connection to the, sort of the fact that the plan, which that has made me think about certain things. For example, like Irish language writers, people always sort of think of, you know, Irish language writers are, you know, Irish, they're in, they're in Ireland. You know, and um, I've just been reading a guy called Colin Ryan, an um, Australian writer, and he's written short stories. They're all set in Australia. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, to the best of my knowledge, he's never been in Ireland. Um, there's a guy called Hanu Pateri Hoglund, who lives in Finland, who used to live in Ireland. He's written a, an amazing book called uh, Lower Niva, uh, The Book of Poison, which is based on it's sort of mixing up Irish folklore and H.P. Lovecraft, the Cthulhu mythos of uh, H.P. Lovecraft. He's based in Finland. You've got Alex yeah. Hyman's down in Brazil. Uh, there, there's a number of other people. So I think uh, at one stage, at some stage next year, I'm going to have an event, you know, which will be Irish language, right, language writers from around the world because normally we, we can easily bring them on onto a, a, a virtual platform and do something interesting there. The other thing, though, as well, is I've always felt with Imran, like, I, we invest a lot of money in all these projects. And uh, I, although I had sound archive, I never had a filmed archive. And, you know, you, you invest a massive, I invest in a massive amount of work and time and energy into creating things and then then you sort of see them disappeared you know so it's, it'll be nice to have an archive we're also doing interviews with authors in conjunction with the museum of literature in ireland so that and the idea is that we'll have these interviews broadcast on their on their radio station their online radio station but they will also form a part of an archive is i think it's very important to document the lies um, of Irish language writers to have them on, you know, a, a, a record that you can listen to, that an archive that people can listen to in future generations. I think that's right. I think I, I mean I think it's brilliant. To, it would be brilliant to have an ongoing archive like that that people can go back to. I know we're we're, we're running out of time, but just but just to mention. I mean, just I just tell just because this, the Duino Elegies are going to be producing Irish again a whole series of films, which is again very uh, yeah, a very interesting project. There's Movagoshta, which is taken from the the book by Shosef Macarena Mavala Hain. So that it's sort of based on that. And then you have Kran, which is based on uh, Richard Berengarten's poem, Tree, as as a symphonic hymn to a tree in all its aspects. So you have a version of that by by Gabriel Rosensuck and, uh, and um, the involvement of all kinds of people in, in that as well. And so they're all happening in, in December on different dates. And I think it's it's... The website, Liam, is www.imram.ie, isn't that That's it? That's it, yeah. And we're also very active on Facebook. A good idea is to follow us on Facebook, but uh, the, the full programme of events will be, be there at imram.ie, um, so you can see everything there. That's brilliant. So thanks again, I appreciate you coming in today uh, to talk to us about that. And I strongly urge anybody listening to check out some or all of these really interesting films coming up this month. So that's Imram. And again, details will be at www.imram.ie or on our website, booksforbreakfast.buzzsprout.com as well. So thanks again, Liam. And we'll go out as we came in with music by Sean McCurlane and words by Maura Wakati from Rilke's Duino Elegies. This is the second elegy. Maravna do Ofer gach angel is fosker bold de meaulig machach na kanam vor lihe a ende an anama shibshe er gali de vor ngel le shamas kar gauder lehe ho bayish nor hasche nor skna hoige on nach ud sar rehne gavshe ede he begon dan moher is mele he er skion do da rershan o ganach ne no ganig femer yark er gefiflach eschen Da schulich und tardangel beilich und trassen kämen an Arde und Ardrona, ne Fahnig, wie Speer in der Welt, wie mir Planke her erlaubt, ich turgen ar Grieche Fähnig, kein Mi. There he was, sitting alone, no more than 20 feet away. Ella stared hard, willing the slivers of mirror to explain what was happening. The stranger was frowning, his lips folded in on themselves. Ellis was aware of the tremor in his hand again, a nervy tug up his arm into his shoulder. He couldn't possibly be from the Prudential, could he? Surely that was long since over. Virginia had refunded the money paid out on Ellis's claim, fraudulently submitted according to the assessors, but what would those chumps know? The only other person who knew about that ghastly business was Uncle Freddy, but he was, thankfully, in America. Perhaps the man had been hired by a creditor. Was this how it happened? Arrested over a trifling sum? 
Alice swallowed hard. How he hated the constant sensation that life was fracturing under his feet, cracking, collapsing. Any minute the ice was going to break and his body would plummet through the hole into a bottomless freezing lake. What next? If he went straight home and was followed, the man would know where he lived. But perhaps he already did, had trailed him from the house, in fact, and was playing this cat and mouse game to taunt him. Excuse me. The man was beside him, one hand fumbling in his pocket. A knife! Ellis's fear, a vast foaming breaker, rose again. Every pointless moment in his life, every second of greed or avarice pricked him. Regret was blood red and pin sharp. The man tugged a balled up handkerchief from his pocket and blew his nose loudly. A knife. Where was he, the Odeon? Ellis flushed, embarrassed by the intensity of his private melodrama. You are Ellis Spender, aren't you? For a moment, Ellis was about to deny it. How could this stranger prove anything? But if he was a policeman, would Ellis be in more trouble for denying it? Was denying your own self a crime? Oh, the intriguing world of Ellis Spencer. And that was Henrietta McCurvey reading from her new novel, A Talented Man, published this year by Hachette Ireland. Well, Henrietta McCurvey was born in Belfast and she now lives in Dublin. She's a prolific novelist with a flair for page turning narratives. Since 2015, she's published an impressive four novels, all of them unique in their own way, all of them evocative and compelling reads, full of a natural wit and intelligence. They're abundant with imaginative details and they're wide ranging in their choice of story. And just to give you a taster of some of these stories, Her first novel, What Becomes of Us, published by Hachette Books Ireland in 2015, is about a young woman and her life-changing encounter with a former member of Common Amman, who for 50 years kept secret her involvement in the 1916 Rising. And her second book, The Heart of Everything, is the story of estranged adult children forced back together when their mother mysteriously disappears. And that was published in March 2016. She's a really prolific writer. And in her third novel, Violet Hill, published in 2018, post-war and present day London is the setting for a book about two female detectives who live a hundred years apart, but in the same place, Violet Hill. And that's another very clever page turning read. Uh, Henrietta's recent novel, A Talented Man, was published this year, as I just said, and it really got absolutely great reviews. The Sunday Times said Henrietta McCurvey's brilliant new novel is all about stories. It's about the stories we tell regarding ourselves. Are we the hero or the villain of our own lives? It's about what gives a story value and the ways in which a story can take on a life of its own for better or for worse. A Talented Man is a wonderfully entertaining read and it's a review that I I have to agree with. It's a book I thoroughly enjoyed. I'd like to congratulate you on it, Henrietta, and welcome you to Books for Breakfast. (laughs) Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Just to start off, the idea of an imposter in literature, it's appeared in many novels. I'm thinking of books like The Life and Loves of a She-Devil by Faye Weldon or The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas or even The Wizard of Oz, which we all watched as children is an imposter in the novel by um, L. Frank Baum. So the title of your book, A Talented Man, is it obviously a nod to Patricia Highsmith's thriller, The Talented Mr. Ripley? In your novel, obviously, we heard there from that piece, we've Alice Spencer. He comes up with an ingenious plan to solve his financial problems. But I was just wondering, could you tell listeners a little bit about Alice's plans without spoiling the plot, of course? And did you in some way, did you have Ripley at the back of your mind when you were writing this book? I cert- yes, Ripley was certainly there for, for one aspect of Ellis's. I, I love Patricia Highsmith. I think she's an amazing suspense yeah. writer. And even though the later Ripley books, I find stretch credulity a little. The, the first one is so mm. pin sharp in the way he's drawn. And my challenge to myself with writing Ellis was, can I write a character that, like Ripley, does the most awful, awful crimes and such there's no morality you know there's no desire for heroism whatsoever it's completely immoral and that you still want him to get away with it you still are on his side and that was the challenge I gave myself could I write someone that was so awful and yet the reader had their fingers crossed behind their back <laughs> you know yeah which is very like Ripley really yeah. so I think you've achieved that actually and reading your novel I felt that the really talented man of the novel isn't in fact Alice but it's Bram Stoker himself 
And Ellis is a forger of his work, but you as a writer, you were kind of a forger too. And I was just wondering, it must have been so enjoyable to mimic the style of Bram Stoker in the sequel, The Undead Count that you wrote. <laughs> Particularly I had as, such fun, yeah. Yeah, it I mean, your good. styles are so different. So it must have been fun to get into that, was it? It was actually really liberating. I mean, Dracula, the book, it's a bit of a messy beast, really. In some ways, yeah. it's sort of all over the shop, you know, and there's loads of things going on in it. But there's an energy to it. And the way it was so preoccupied with the things Victorians were preoccupied with, you know, like agency and lack of meaning and lack of power and keeping power and uh, like so Mm. many things and invasions and that I just found it was so, and also the contemporary technology that Stoker adopted at the time that he was really interested in telegrams and phonographs and recordings and, you know, even using contemporary typewriters. So there was a lot of scope within it to sort of let loose a bit. And in fact, I wrote way more of the undead count than I needed to use I just enjoyed it so much. I actually worked out a plot for it and then just wrote sections of it, you know, that I used in the book. But that was hugely enjoyable, much more enjoyable. I thought that was going to feel like a bit of a chore, to be honest, or sort of a a more challenging part. But it was actually really liberating to write it. It was a total surprise to you. That's interesting. Your novel comes with a host of other characters, too. It's not just Alice. There's his, I think it's fair to say, quite beleaguered mother, Virginia. <laughs> she was yeah. once friend to Ban- Bram Stoker and his wife. And then there's the uncle, an absolute chancer, the impresario. Anyway, he himself, you know, stacks up a large amount of debts and he's escaped to L.A., in Hollywood, very exciting. But they add a great energy to the novel. I, I was just thinking as a novelist, you seem very ordered. It's it's well structured, your novel. And they're there for a reason, aren't they? They're there to, to help them in a way access material. Isn't that right? Or is that why you intended them to be there? Could you just talk a bit about them? Yes, I suppose. I mean, it needed to flesh out his world. Like we need to understand, especially because Alice is such a damaged character we need to understand what's happened to him and you know some of that you get a sense of through the book and some is more of a reveal later on that you understand yeah. what's happened to him yeah. so he needed to have a cast of characters around him that made him seem more real you know even when they were just being yeah. they were off doing their thing and he wasn't necessarily involved in it but they made him you know these older yeah. adults in his life have made him what he is so that was part of the reason and then also obviously with the book the sort of structural narrative reasons as well You know, Ellis in the book isn't even 30 and Bram Stoker has been dead for decades. Florence Stoker, his wife, is dead a year. But for Ellis to have had realistic contact or knowledge of the family, it obviously needs to be the older adults in his life. So his parents and his uncle who would have had contact with them. Because it was actually Florence Stoker originally was how I got into the story. Um, Just from reading about her and what an interesting woman it sounds like she was and the version of her that we have come to I suppose, be more faithful to was the version of her is the one post Bram's death where she became this very resolute executor of his yeah. of his literary career and took on anybody who she felt mm-hmm. wasn't respectful of that. Yeah. And I think that must have been a really interesting position for her. She was trying to promote his work and earn money from his work while also stopping anything that she felt was an unfair or inappropriate use mm-hmm. of his work. And I'd imagine that's tricky, quite a tricky balance. So that was actually how I got into the story yeah. originally was for meeting her about her and Dracula. Yeah, that's very interesting. And then it says your novel in 1938. So Florence had died around that period. So was there was there a reason why you set it in that time? Um, yeah, there was two reasons, actually. One is that for it technically to work, I think for it to feel like a, a genuinely possible narrative, Florence Stoker needed to be dead. Like It was just that simple. She was too involved in everything that was happening to do with her Bram's work that if a forged manuscript of Dracula appeared in 1938 and she was alive, she would have been all over it. And that would, as a, for me writing the book, that would have been a very tricky complication to solve yeah. without making her look like a dupe. And I also have what I, what I call a biographical squeamishness. I'm kind of reluctant to represent real people yeah. in a way I feel it might be unfair to them, you know, yeah. or it might be like so. And I thought that would be a really unfair thing to do to her who worked so hard for her husband's legacy to then make her be fooled by something. Yeah. Um, so I thought, no, she has to be dead. And then in 1938, I'm also really interested in the period just before and after a war. So Violet Hill is set, it's half set in 1919. Mm-hmm. And it's just that sense of in 1938 and going through old newspaper archives of the time, like for a lot of 1938, there was still a real sense of it'll be fine. That's fine. How could that possibly happen again? There couldn't possibly be another war. We've just done that, you know, and people genuinely not believing 
that it could happen. Mm -hmm. So the period that we now look back on as that period just before the Second World War to them was 1938. It was the years after the Great War, which could never happen again. That's why we call it the Great One. So I was really interested, well, what Mm -hmm. did it feel like to live then, you know? And the uh, being able to bring in Dracula and the Undead Count, mm-hmm. you have that sense of the vampires massing in the East. You have the sense of this massive disquiet starting to build. And of course, yeah. in Europe at the time, it's much more than disquiet. But the perception of it for a lot of people, especially of Ellis's generation and place in society, they didn't see it for what it was at the time. So I was really... So the ominous arrival of war is paralleled with the arrival of the ominous Dracula. Yes, exactly. So it's kind of, they're both parallel. It's very imaginative idea. You must have been really pleased when you got that moment of inspiration that this, that you entered it through Florence's world and then this whole other world opened up. It's it's quite exciting writing a novel. It really is, it? actually. Yeah, when yeah. little things like that sort of pop and fall into place and there are just these yeah. connections you could never have figured out in any other way, but from just p- picking one thread and just, you know, pulling at it. <laughs> and then I found Bram, like a exactly. And then Bram, I found Bram Stoker had written a book in 1910 about famous imposters because he was fascinated okay. by forgery and imposters. And so yeah. I thought, okay, that's perfect. So, <laughs> yeah. It's all connecting. Yeah. And of course, the Lyceum Theatre as well, it's very integral to your novel. And it's also in Joe Connor's, Joseph O'Connor's novel, Shadow yeah. Play, which is also about Stoker. I know they're both entirely different novels. But I could just see reading it out the Lyceum Theatre would attract the imagination of, of two novelists. So do you, do you want to talk about that? In a way, it's kind of an extra character in the book, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. And I suppose it's such an important space in the book, but it also is doing... A, and this did happen in 1938. The theatre was briefly converted to a cinema, which I have it is in the book. And I, I thought that was really interesting then at the time that theatres, which had been so critical for entertainment and so important and had such a a place in the lives of, no, admittedly, I would say middle class and upwards people more so, like somewhere like the Lyceum. But then they were all being switched over to cinemas. So they were doing a different job entirely. They were showing American movies mainly, you know, they weren't even local. And I just thought that was another little how the outside world was infringing on it. And in the case of the Lyceum, it ended up being a complete failure because the guy who was running it at the time couldn't get rights to show any movies. Mm. And it was converted back to a theatre almost immediately at great expense, you know, um, which I just found like a really interesting little added detail. But the idea of having also my characters wandering around a theatre when it's not in use. What is it if it's not in use? It's just this big, slightly creepy building. Yeah, yeah. Perfect for a novel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, and then what I also enjoyed about this book is it brought me back to other books, which I always think is a good sign when you're reading a book. It inspires you to read more. So I was thinking of books like Moonstone or The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins or Carmilla by Sheridan Le Fanu or even the Gothic in contemporary novels like Sarah Perry's The Essex Serpent. So I was just wondering, were you always a fan of these kinds of novels? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Contemporary ones, say Rebecca and now Sarah Waters, I think does that Gothic, like also more contemporary Gothic as well as I think her Victorian novels are fantastic. Yeah, anything with that. The more vampire or monstery it gets, actually, the more I back away. But that sort of creepy sense of Gothic in real life, I find can be absolutely yeah. terrifying. Yeah. So I, I think that's a great place to go. And it's a great place to write as well. It's really intriguing yeah. to try and pull off that job of making that convincingly scary, I think is a real yeah. challenge. I think you've achieved it in the book. I really enjoyed it. And then just finally, at this section of the interview, I was just wondering, it's a very strange time for you to have brought out a book in the middle of a pandemic. And but at the same time, I, I'm just wondering, did it inspire you, the quietness of the city? I know you live in the, in the centre of the city, close enough anyway to the city. Did you find that that quiet time inspired you to get writing again and getting on the move with the new book? Have you anything on the go at the moment? Um, I do have something on the go, yeah, which I did write. I started kind of late spring, early summer. Overall, I found it really tricky mm-hmm. to write. You just have this feeling that your head is so full with other stuff. And I find it even hard to unpack what all of that other stuff really is. Mm -hmm. And it was gorgeous walking around the city when it was so quiet. Like myself and my daughter went out on our bikes. We were cycling because we were R2K when it was the 2K lockdown. Grafton Street was kind of the edge of R2K. So we'd cycle in around Stevens Green and look at, we could look at buildings and things you couldn't see normally when it was busy. And one day we were the, I said, let's cycle down Grafton Street and we were the only people. And so that was kind of nice to be able to do things like that. And I would hope to give her a positive memory of 
all of the the situation. Um, but overall, I just found it really hard to work actually <laughs> to get into anything. Well, hopefully when things open up, we'll all be liberated into writing new stuff again. Yeah. So let's let's move on then, Henrietta, because thank you for that and talking about your book, A Talented Man, which if anyone hasn't read it, I really urge them to. And we're going to move on now to the Toaster Challenge where Henrietta is going to talk about a book that's really touched her for two to three minutes and it's about the length of time it takes to make a slice of toast. So Peter is going to get the the bread ready and we're going to put it down and are you ready Henrietta? It's one, two, three and off you go. My tatty paperback copy of Anagrams was published in 1988 but I didn't buy it then. It was probably in the early 90s. I was a fan of Nick Hornby because Fever Pitch was published in 1992 and I came across something he'd said about this amazing American writer called Laurie Moore, who I'd never heard of. So in The Way You Do or maybe The Way You Did Then, I went into town and bought the first book of hers I found, Anagrams. And it's nearly 30 years later and I'm still glad that I did. It's described as a novel, but it really pushes back against that description. It's closer to a novel in short stories and also its own thing entirely. I think it's really quite special. Protagonist Benna Carpenter makes anagrams out of words, but also out of life. In the first chapter, Escape from the Invasion of the Love Killers, she is a nightclub singer who lives across the hall from Gerard Maines. He teaches a sort of aerobics to preschoolers. She drinks a six pack of near beer for breakfast every day and jadedly mentions a husband killed in a car crash. In the second chapter, Strings Too Short to Use, the chapter names actually support my not really a novel theory, I think. Uh, Benna is an aerobics teacher and in a relationship with a musician called Gerard, who has moved into the apartment across the hall from hers in a living together, not living together compromise, or as Benna puts it, his way of appeasing my desire to discuss our future. In the third, Yard Sale, a tired lounge pianist called Gerard is moving to start law school in California. He is taking his dog, but not his girlfriend, Benna. I know what will happen, Benna thinks. He will promise to write every other day, but when it turns out to be once a week, he will promise to write once a week. And when it becomes once a month, and even that's a postcard, he'll get on the phone and say, Benna, I promise you, once a month I'll write. He will start saying false, lawyerly things like, you know I'm extremely busy and I'm doing my best. He will be the first to bring up the expense of long-distance calls. Words like res ipsa locator and ill behooves will suddenly appear on his tongue like carbuncles. He will talk about what some other people said and what he and some other people did. And when he never specifically mentions women, it will be like the Soviet news agency, which never publicised anything containing the names of the towns where the new bombs are. So by the last chapter, the none of that, it's called, Benna is going to visit her brother Louis for Christmas. A close friend of hers has died and she needs to get away. We've met so many Bennas by then, singer, aerobics teacher, poet, mother, lover, friend. And yet the truth, or such as it ever is, is clear. It's like this golden thread that shines through the chapter and pulls you through the story. But the thread is reality and imagination. It's the stitches in Benna's broken heart. I think nobody writes tragedy intertwined with comedy like Laurie Moore. Her writing is mysterious and clever and bold and joyous, even when her characters are miserable. Anagrams is so well-crafted and admirable from a technical point of view, but the clever construction isn't why I love it. She turns words inside out and makes them dance. I've read it many times, once every two years now, though for the first decade, I'd say it was once a year. She doesn't go easy on the reader. In fact, she hurts us. But she does so in such a vital, honest way. You will forgive her. I forgive her every, every time. Amazing. I actually haven't read that book, but I'm bursting to read it now, having heard you. It it sounds amazing the way there are different versions uh, of of the two characters. I can see see it there, your your well-worn copy. 30 years yeah. old. Oh, yeah. And she I was know. 29 just... when she wrote that. That was her debut novel. She'd written a collection of short stories, hadn't she? Which I had actually read called Self Help. That's right. So it's very interesting to hear yeah. how you were nearly describing it. You're wondering, is it a novel? Is it a collection of stories? But it all blends so imaginatively together. The idea of being in love and not being in love. And I was reading about her and she said that she got such a shock when the publishers rang her and said they were going to take it. And she said, I was in a constant state of surprise. You're so alone when you write that you tend to be unaffected by reviews. You only wonder whether you can write something again you can believe in. But she's a writer who actually has, as you totally believe in the, the various worlds she's created in that novel. You're still reading it 
And I could see actually parallels with your own writing as well, because I think you're great at creating worlds that we also believe in, whether it's Violet Hill in 1918 or, you know, it's Ella Spencer, the brilliant forger of Bram Stoker. So I'd like to thank you, Henrietta, for bringing that book to our attention. I'll certainly be looking for it. And of course, I'd like to thank you for coming into Books for Breakfast, uh, talking about your own novel as well. So we were talking about Anagrams by Laurie Moore and A Talented Man, published by Hachette Ireland this year. We were very lucky to have Henrietta McCurvey here. And just before she goes, I'd just like to quote the Irish Times, who said that A Talented Man is a stylish, compelling and utterly absorbing, atmospheric, beautifully written novel. It sounds very like Laurie Moore's own writing. And if listeners haven't got a copy of A Talented Man, I really urge you to do so. I think it's perfect reading for Christmas time curl up by fire and read it. So thank you very much. And as usual, all details on both books will be available on www.booksforbreakfast.buzzsprout.com. So thank you, Henrietta. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, I think we've reached the end of our Books for Breakfast podcast this morning. I'm definitely rushing off to have more coffee. And I'm Enda Wiley and I have Peter Sarah here with me. And Peter, would you like to tell everyone about the details of the podcast if they'd like to listen again? Well, you can subscribe at all the usual sources, Google and Apple and so on. And if you want to check out the notes that go along with this podcast, you can go to booksforbreakfast.buzzsprout.com. And yeah, so. We'll be back again next Thursday morning. We'll have the toast on. We'll have the kettle boiling. We will have more books to discuss. And we're looking forward to having you here. So goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.